Hello and welcome to the 32nd episode of the Pirate Rugby Pod. We are now past 900 YouTube subscribers, so thank you so much to everyone for tuning in and following us this far. You know the drill, if you like what we do, like, comment and subscribe. We always reply to everyone who leaves a comment, so get in amongst it. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter as well and subscribe to the Substack. The links for both are in the link tree link in the description box below. If you subscribe to the Substack, you'll get an email every time we drop a new piece of content, including some new features that we've got coming this week, which I'm looking forward to share with you. More on that later. Um, no ender this week, you may have deduced by his dulcet Irish tones not being the ones introducing this podcast, but never fear, I'm joined by not one, but two exciting dynamic personalities here to talk rugby with me. They are the host of the Cardiff Central podcast and well-known Welsh rugby personality, Dr. Harley Worthy, and the uh, biggest known candle maker on Twitter, um, who is also into a rugby, uh, Leslie, aka Missile Panda. Good evening, both. Hello. Good evening. How's things going? International weather check isn't going to be very interesting this week because we're all within about 200 miles of each other. Uh, dull and grey in sunny Fife, or not so sunny. Uh, I did see this weird yellow orb in the sky for about five minutes today. I don't know what it is. I don't like it. Can I have my grey and cloud back, please? <laughs> it was nice this morning here in the Midlands and then that quickly changed. Anyway. Let's waste no more time on that. So let's have our rugby moments of the week. I'm going to go first. So um, my rugby moment of the week comes in stages. So the Scarlets won a game. That was a moment. Um, and the player who played the best for us in that game was Alex Craig. And I was looking at his stats after the game. And he said, according to Rugby Pass, that he beat nine defenders. Now, for context, Duhan van der Merwe beat eight defenders in the 1872 Cup a few weeks ago. And people were going mad about it. Like it was the most exciting thing that ever happened. So I was like, a second row who plays for the Scarlets beating nine defenders, that's a big deal. So I tweeted Opta Johnny, who is the, um, Opta is the big stats company and Opta Johnny is the rugby page. And I said, I've got this from this website that says he beat nine defenders, that must be a record. And they quote tweeted me and said, that is the joint most defenders beaten by a second row for the URC since we've been taking stats. Uh, joined with Nakarawa, who, for people who don't know Nakarawa, is a Fijian second row, absolute legend of the game, offloading central things. So that was exciting. And then the Scarlets themselves quote tweeted Dr. Johnny, like, yay, this is great. And then Alex Craig himself quote tweeted that. So I am the pebble in the pond and the ripples are going everywhere. And I've started that and I've made Alex Craig's day, maybe. So I'm happy about that. So that's my moment. Leslie, what was your moment? Uh, my moment of the week was Helen Nelson's kicking, 100% from the tee this week. Uh, given how poor, I think we'll say, she was last to Six Nations, to, to 100% from the tee, this game was great. And they weren't particular, not all of them were easy kicks either. So I think that was is my. Nice moment of the week. Good to see. Yeah, there's a nice one from the touchline, I remember, on the right touchline that was really impressive. Mm. You got one, Harley? Uh, you are. Well, I mean, my book, I've, I've got my moment of the week is uh, my daughter's first birthday and uh, spend it, spending the time spend the time with that. So, you know, I've managed to keep a small human alive for a whole year, which, you know, I, I feel quite, quite proud of myself for that. Um, <laughs> it is know. impressive when you phrase it like that. Yeah. Of course, um, you keep rugby alive every day at work at the doctor's surgery. I'm not that kind of doctor. We keep going through this. I'm a biochemist. Anyway, but my rugby moment of week comes from the same game as Leslie, and for me, it's what Cecilia Tuapalotu's picking up where she left off, going over for bowling over for a try. Because whenever that that late young lady plays, it makes me happy. She's a proper superstar. Like people get probably excited every time that her name is mentioned. She is one of the biggest names in the Six Nations. It's amazing. Uh, listeners' moments. We love hearing your listeners' moments of the week. Harry Jones, the famous poetic Harry Jones. He posted. A, he replied with a moment of the week, but it wasn't in words. It was a sketch of himself, um, and he may claim it's not actually himself. But it was a bald man with a beard, with who was fairly. Burley, shall we say, in a nice way. Um, 
a man holding a Georgia flag fighting a dragon, which I think was a reference to Georgia calling out Wales. Um, but that was his moment of the week. I think his moment of the week was the call out rather than the sketch itself. But with Harry, you know, there's always there's always something bigger going on. So who knows? Uh, who else did we have? We had uh, our friend Maz from France. Bonsoir, Maz uh, said that her moment of the week was the entire UBB versus Stad to Lose match, an absolute thriller, a classic. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, and Cardiff Central podcast. We don't know anything about them. Um, said that their moment of the week was Teddy Williams making 32 tackles away to Glasgow. An unbelievable effort. And then Scarlet's Fever said uh, Edwin Swart scoring a try. I wonder who posted that, that one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who those guys. They follow me around. We, anyway. We, we definitely didn't post them ourselves. <laughs> okay, right. That's enough of that. So let's talk about some actual rugby that actually happened. Not much news uh, to distract us this week, which I'm actually quite happy about. It means we can talk about the real things. So, Women's Six Nations kicked off this weekend. We've all enjoyed it. First, I just want to hear your general thoughts on the first weekend in total. Uh, Women's Six Nations, does it still feel like it's got the growth and the momentum behind it? Is the standard still growing year on year? Leslie, what did you make of it? Um, I think... We had two very good games and one lot less good game. Um, standards definitely feel a little better. Um, I thought Ireland particularly looked a lot better than they did last year. Mm-hmm. They're definitely, I don't know about, about you guys, but for me, I, I've definitely not seen as much buzz and content around it that we did last year it's been a, to me it's been a lot quieter I don't know what you guys have thought but yeah um not um not not a lot of content being created by creators if you know what I mean not a lot of social media posting you're getting the odd thing but yeah I, I don't know I don't know if it's because we've just had the men's and there's been no real break we've not had a breathing space as such it's just been straight in but I don't know if we're all feeling a bit of fatigue I don't know but it definitely doesn't feel there was no buzz or excitement that we got last year when we had a bit of a break between the men's and the women's Um, but still good games I I, I, I agree with Leslie there I think it I think it has been and when you think about it you know we had the world cup with debut the BXV sort of sandwiched in. Then we're straight back in. Huge pack league because there's no World well, International break. You had your Europe, you had your Six Nations. And now we've straight back into the Women's Six Nations. It's almost like you haven't had time to catch your breath, you know. And, you know, some content creators like um, Squid, who, you know, have been quite open about how, like, mentally exhausting it is just to try and focus on one block of a few weeks. I mean, I, as much as I love how the fact that the Women's Tournament is separate, I do feel it does need like a week or two gap in between. Because, you know, particularly if you follow like a club side as well, and you're excited that your club side's back, and then he's like, oh, hang on, Wales women are playing as well. And trying to watch all those games in one year. I was quite lucky being a Cardiff fan. My, you know, our game was on the Friday night. So then Saturday I could I could focus on watching the women's rugby. Um, but yeah, I agree. It's not, it definitely didn't have the best. So not compared to last year, you know, when, was it last year or the year before? I'm pretty sure it was last year when TikTok got announced as the big, the big title sponsor. Yeah. And there's a lot of hoo-ha and whereas now it's like, oh, it's just it's the same. Yeah, like Leslie, we spoke about this last time you were on the pod about the content creation. And I still think that as a viewer, what as a watching experience, I think the women's Six Nations is presented and the content around it is a lot better than the men's. I think that yeah. I think the men's Six Nations is very much phoned in by the likes of the BBC and you know everyone knows that I don't like ITV and the online content is pretty pretty much nothing. Like I found myself on TikTok watching tutorials of how to do the the Dutch is it the Dutch plats? Is yep. that what they're called? Yeah, and Bruce, yeah. Um, so I need to learn. <laughs> yeah and um it's all the players who do it themselves and like the the women's players get social media a lot more i don't know whether it's because they use it more than men do i don't know but yeah it, um i saw 
quite a lot. So we say I'm on TikTok too, so I saw a lot of Scottish players on their own accounts doing stuff. Um, and there was a little bit through the official Scottish, you know, rugby channel, but nothing, nothing like what we saw last year, which I thought was a bit disappointing. But we've, there's been no, we've not had the same build up because the men's didn't finish until, you know, last week, and then we've had one week. It's a lot to cram into a week, you know. Mm. Plus, with URC, as Harley said, back and stuff. It's just the content that we've seen has been good. Mm. It's just not been enough of it. Yeah, I thought particularly in the Wales uh, Scotland game with Lee McKenzie hosting and all the pundits they had. The uh, I messaged you about this, Leslie. The comms and the co-comms. I think was it was it Nick Heath who was doing the lead comms for the Ireland France game, France Ireland game. <coughs> uh, yes. I so, yeah. I thought that was particularly good. I thought that was one yes. of the best commentary and co-coms I've heard in a long time. Um, yeah, Jade Conkle the, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Properly talking about like, and they're targeting the 15 meter and they're really going for this and they're trying to do that and they, they hope to do this. And it's like, ah, we're talking about rugby <laughs> like, rather it's than trying to make that. Nice it's better than the ref chat. Oh my God. Yeah, so much. everything is better than ref chat, even if I yeah. do descend hypocritically descend into it myself. <laughs> yes. Same, same. Um, the and like I said, the, the show that was hosted by Lee McKenzie and things, it's just so. I'm going to come out and say it. It's because the people who are doing it are doing it on merits. They got their jobs on merits rather than their names, which is what you have in the merits game. So that's why I think it's so much better. But anyway, so that's kind of that side of it. I think for me, the big difference that I, I feel compared to last year is the kicking and the kicking from hand. I think mm -hmm. it's um, better because I remember having conversations, maybe not last year, maybe the year before with people about how it was still something like a big difference between the men's and the women's game was the kicking and now that feels like that's changed and it feels like the women are getting just as much distance on the kicks as the men's are now and that, that's a big difference and the goal kicking like you said there Leslie the touchline conversions and things we weren't really seeing a few years ago that we are now do you think we're seeing the benefit of the Celtic challenge at all for the likes of the Irish Scottish and Welsh In your own time. <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. Um, for fringe players, yes, it's probably been useful for, for um, like Alex Stewart coming in uh, to the Scotland team. But I don't. It, it's been valuable game time, but whether it's been beneficial, I don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't think so because a lot of those players. For Scotland, anyway, our prem players and didn't. We only had a few per game, so it probably didn't make a huge difference. I don't think. Hmm. For me, anyway, you may have other thoughts. Yeah, I'm. I'm probably with Leslie on this again. Wales, the Wales team, it's sort of been, more, you know, it's mostly Premiership players. But what it Celtic Challenge did give is something for all the Worcester Warrior players who, you know, basically they went to New Zealand, came back and found they didn't have a job. Which, you know, I don't imagine how hard that would have been on them. It gave, you know, it gave, I know, I know like Sean and Harry's retired and, you know, this isn't playing anymore, but, you know, like the likes of Alex Calendar and Natalia John, it gave them somewhere so they can at least get some match fitness so they're not coming Alex in. Alex Calendar had a great game as well. Um, for Ireland, I think it's worked quite well because it's given them some cohesion. You know, I mean, they may have walked through the Celtic Challenge because, you know, it, for them, it was basically their, their whole squad really. And they go through, but it at least, Gave them some momentum, so then again they're not starting cold. Yeah, uh, I think. To be fair, you know, I'd like maybe we need to get an Irish guest on to talk about this more. But the IR, IRFE were getting a lot of stick for the women's game this time last year, um, and obviously they didn't do very well in the Six Nations. Now, since the Wolfhounds dominated Celtic Challenge, and yeah, they didn't get the result out in France, but everyone's saying like, "Wow, that they're a lot better than they were." Maybe that is starting to turn, and obviously the Sevens program is going a lot better as well. Uh, over in Ireland for the women, so that's interesting. Right, let's let's talk about the actual games then. So let's start off because um, it all affects us here with Wales versus Scotland, a historic win for Scotland. It feels like every Wales Scotland game it finishes with a squeaky bum time. Like it, it's always. And to be fair, I think you know, and I, you know, I hope I'm not being harsh on this. It felt like if Wales had got the draw at the end, that would have been a robbery of Scotland. I don't know. 
Leslie, you've you got to be the emotions for that game for you must have been delighted and also terrified. <laughs> yeah, just it was just deja vu from you know a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, I mean, I would. It would be great if we did continually see Wales comebacks in Scotland games. I would. That would be great. Um, I thought our, our Scottish defence was very good for the whole game, pretty much. And looking at some of the stats that came out today and some of the tackles that um, Scotland players made, it, it kind of uh, you know confirms what we, what we kind of thought. Um, I thought our attack looked really good. When we got going, really dangerous. You know, we've got Ronan Lloyd, Green Grant, Emma Orr. You know, any any one of those is a threat at any time. Um, and I thought they looked great. I thought Wales's backline didn't look, not say bad, but not as good as Scottish backs. I don't think. But you've got you know great forwards. You've got Cecilia to mm -hmm. for a start. You've got Alex Callender. I thought your your forwards looked pretty good. I thought Wales did look a little bit kind of sluggish at times, maybe. Just a bit. And I don't know if it's because you have a new ten and it's about a settling in period and you know nothing it's not going to click necessarily overnight, but yeah, I thought that there was at times it just you know, miss passes being dropped and there was a, a a period, I can't remember who it was, I think it might be in the scrum half. She she spent ages trying to look for someone to pass it to. It was just that that cohesion just wasn't there of getting quick ball to get something going. But yeah, um I think Scotland were probably the better team on the day. Mm -hmm. Um probably deserved the win. Not that it always works out like that, but I thought we were the better team. Yeah, I, I definitely agree that you were the better team. Um, so, Harley, the, the stat, and we, we Leslie spoke about the Scotland defence there for a second. Um, Scotland missed five tackles all game. The, the whole team, five tackles. That's a, that's a credit to Scotland's defence, but what does that say about Wales' attack? This, this, this is the problem. I mean, bear in mind that um, Young Kerm has built his team around the, the Gloucester heartbreak, you know, this, this unstoppable force. And you think, oh, well, you know, there's going to be loads of cohesion there. And you sort of look, start looking at it, you're like, well, yes, but then you've got the Bristol scrub half with the Buster 10, and they've not really played much together. So actually, maybe you're losing a little bit of connection there. Um, Nell Metcalf, although she has been playing for Glossa Hartbury, a lot of her time has been with Granny Lightning. And you start breaking it down. Um, was it the fullback? Oh, names escape me because, again, as we spoke off, um, names do not stick in my head. It's really irritating. So we've talked a lot about different player names. Um, but, you know, again, the, the certain key pieces haven't quite played be together before. I think that's going to cause some problems. But, yeah, it's, you know, we, we know Wales have got a great pack. I, it's not often we can say this about Wales side, admittedly. Yeah. But it does feel like we haven't, I mean, it's something me and, me and yourself, you have spoken a lot about off air in you know various conversations. There is seems there seems to be a problem in Wales rugby with about detail around attacks. We just we just don't seem to be able to do it at the moment. No matter whether it's men's, women's, age grade, you know, at a URC level, senior level, it it it's just all very one up runners and hope for moments of magic. Scarlets under 18s are the only good attacking Welsh side that I've watched. <laughs> this season um but yeah and all yeah. of them are going to be in the english championship next year anyway oh my god yeah no, they're going to be playing for amptill anyway um the the, the point about like cecilia t velocity was getting a lot of mentions on this pod um if you whenever we're within five meters of the scotland line i'm like just give it to cecilia she will score the try like like bless the rest of you for being here you know <laughs> like just pass it to the and um i always pronounce the name wrong is it Pierce on the, yeah, on the I'm pretty sure it's Pierce. Um, again, she's always great. She played the full 80 again. Like uh, the, the two props, and this is again, it's not a work, very Welsh thing. The two props are the two class players. Just give them the ball and let them run at, at the Scottish line. But yeah, just the lack of detail. And you got 
you know, you can forget sometimes that Jazz Joyce is playing and she's one of the greatest Welsh players of all time, men's or women's. You know, she's it's, a Mount Rushmore player. I know, I know it's I know it's like almost sacrilege to say in Welsh women's rugby circles, but I don't actually think she had that great a game. I don't think she's had as good a game to as she has, but I don't know if that's just because she's not played a lot of fifteen. She's only been doing sevens, and I'm not sure how much. Unfortunately, I just haven't had time. There's too how much other things. She to because she feels like she's been around forever. I think it's a similar thing to like with the George North thing when you're like you're surprised that he was he's actually she's 28. Yeah, oh God. she's been around forever. Like I think she'd been. I think she broke onto the scene when she was like eighteen. I assume she'd be like thirty-five. Okay, well, oh well, it's good for yeah. good for the rest of us. But um, you know, other names like George Evans, who's sorry, people like players like George Evans was sat on the bench, and then you know, is, is you know, is you know, they've got her to bring on this experience and impact. But is that enough? One thing. But then again. I said Wales women don't really have too much of a problem with the pack until they get up to the top tier size. It is that detail at the back. And mm. um, I remember with late you Leslie, I said after the game, and I said similar thing off um probably to Craig Manson's got a strip bod. It would have been it would have been a robbery if we got that kick. But it was also an awful lot of pleasure to put on Flaggy George. Bear in mind she doesn't kick goals for Gloucester. You know, normally for Wales we have um Hero Bevan. So, you know, maybe we should have, maybe we should look at another one. But, you know, at the same time, she nom- stands up and nominates herself. Oh, we, you know, you know, if you're going to score tries, can you at least just go under the sticks? You know, be, you know, be, be, be less selfish, try scorers. I mean, yeah. to be fair, she wasn't far off, was she? I mean, that was what, hit the poster. Oh, no, it was, it was his. It was a, it was a heartbreakingly like distance. Yeah, and then we had the classic. Uh, if the clock is if the clock's in the red, and um, I came up with a rhyme to this to the tune of that's amore, I can't remember what it what it was. <laughs> anyway, it's it's, it's the Gareth Davis it's no. the Gareth Davis manoeuvre of kick the ball yeah. out. Yeah, it's just like Ellis Bevan did the same thing for Cardiff uh, on the on the Friday night. It's just a but Mark made a good point on the Scarlet squad. The, Mark made a good point in the Scarlet Spot is that the entire team was set up for the kick. So it's not just her fault. Hmm. Like, no one said to her, no way, don't kick it. Yeah, yeah they made a cat pillar rock and everything, didn't they? Yeah. Oh, that reminds me. I don't know if that was a miss hit, though, and they went for like the, the hit and hope, you know, to try and like yeah. make it contestable and just shank the kick. Yeah. Oh, if the ball is kicked dead and the clock's in the red, that's a Welsh come out. That's how the rhyme went. Um, that's reminded me though, um, uh, Leslie. One player I just want you to talk about, who I know that you're a big fan of, who felt like she was in complete control throughout the whole game, is Ra- Rachel Malcolm. Like she was completely unfazed the whole time. One of the best captains Scotland has ever produced. Yes, hundred percent. Um, I I think she's outside of women's rugby, probably not recognised for her how good she is a leader of that team um the way she speaks to the team the way she speaks after matches she's so eloquent you know her heart's on her sleeve as well you know she's she'll happily you don't get the corporate you know sanitized answer she'll she's usually very honest in how she's feeling after a game and i don't know if you saw our our post-match interview just how how happy and delighted she looked Especially, you know, with seven wins in a row with the, the, the team I've had now. And compared to last Six Nations at the beginning where we'd lost a couple of games and, you know, she was, you know, it was so many losses in a row. She was gutted at the time to now see her leading this team. They've got some good vibes going. Um, yeah, she's um, great. I think the men's team could learn a lot from the way Rachel is. Um, on the park, the way she speaks to refs, she's very much in the, I guess maybe like a Sam Warburton kind of mould. She doesn't really speak to the ref much, but when she does, you know it's something that's really quite important to her, and refs tend to then take notice. Uh, she's great. Um, I I'm a Rachel Malcolm fan, definitely. Cool, awesome. Okay, let's move on to the next game then. Uh, well, the game that preceded this, but it's the next game in Podcast Magic World. 
um, is the Ireland, well, France versus Ireland game. Again, we spoke about Ireland um, looking a lot better than we thought. Um, I'm, I'm struggling to get a read on France at the moment. They beat New Zealand in New Zealand during the WXV, but they, it still feels like they're a step behind England. We'll come on to in a bit. Harley, do you have a kind of a view on France at the moment? They've got, I will say that some of their athletes that they've got in their back line are very intimidating. I mean, you, you can almost cut and paste a lot of stuff like we'd say about the um, France, France men's team because it is just a lot of athletes, a lot of very skillful people of both both backs and forwards with a lot of physicality. Um, was it uh, Pauline Bordon Sansus says she's um, taken her wonderful partner and you know the the original Antoine de Pont before Antoine de Pont Antoine de Pont did. Uh, you know uh, she had a typical game. Um, I do feel they looked a bit clunky and slow. I don't know if it's just because they've not really had any preparation for it or you know some some teams Wales are notorious for have just been very slow at start tournaments. Um, but I don't want to take away from Ireland. You know, there was such a huge step up from anything we saw last year. I don't know if it's because we because they've got their sevens players back. I feel like that really only, you know, that's more of a mm. backs thing. But you know, it, it you know, the, the, there was an uptick in their physicality. I thought the defence looked a lot better. You know, yeah, they, they, the they, mind fight after contact. Yeah, there was there was a lot of um, you know, I, there was a better vibe. But you know, as you know, as quantitative and scientific as that is, it's. It just all felt a lot better, um, you know. Arguably, in spite of what the union still, try, the Irish are still trying to pull on them. You know, a lot, I hear a lot of Irish female podcasters and pundits and saying, you know, this is still not, still not great. It still feels second class. It's you know the way they're trying to do professional contracts is really crappy and underhanded and not necessarily allowing the best Irish players to to follow the dreams of being pro when the actual contract itself is a joke and basically unlivable. You know, any, you know, that's in like pretty much any part of Ireland, never mind in the capital of Dublin, which is an incredibly expensive place yeah. to live, I'm told. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was exciting. They seem, you know, I think it's two, try, two three tries they scored. Um, I, 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 I said it was, um, it was in the background too, but, you know, they only scored three last six nations in total. And that looks. I did not know that. <laughs> you know, wow. so uh, I, 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 I believe that's the stat. Um, I probably if that is incorrect, but I'm fairly certain it was only three tries. And you know, I think they got, you know, and it was, you know, and they've brought that margin against France down significantly. I think they only scored three points last last time out, and it was well into the fifties. Yeah, I messaged a couple of people during the game saying, um, "This feels like a very different team." Leslie, do you think the score line was? Fair or harsh? It was 38-17 at full time. Oh, so it might have been three tries, sorry. Um, sorry no, no it's two, sorry, two tries, one penalty. Um, I but, thought... Yeah, was it a fair re reflection of the game? I, th I think it was. Um, I think... Ireland did have their sevens players back, but I don't think they made much of a difference. Um, I was really excited to see Bevan Parsons back. And I don't think she got into the game all that much. She had a couple of carries, but from what we know that she can do in sevens and in fifteens, she just didn't manage to get her any kind of impact on the game. Um, so I, I actually was a nerd and made some notes as I was watching the game. <laughs> I can see you reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I I will forget like, everything about the game. Um, so I had a special mention for Linda Zhugang and you know she was just absolutely everywhere. You, you know, she'd be tackling somebody one minute and then the next minute she's you know having a carry and just didn't stop. Her work rate was phenomenal that game. Um, she's some athlete and yeah she was brilliant. A uh, couple of other standouts I thought Aoife Wafer. Um, Played in Celtic Challenge, um, was great for the Wolfhounds. I think it was the Wolfhounds. Um, she got a try as well. So uh, there's there's still there's still issues, obviously, but their new coach seems to have been making some difference. You know, it's only the first game in charge, but I thought there was at least some positive signs, and it is a very good French team. Yeah, France, France's line out was absolutely dreadful. 
I don't know, like just, just absolutely awful. I, I, I don't know the stats because I haven't checked, but I would it guess says it, it, maybe... it says eighty eight percent according to Robbie Bass, but line out stats. If you like knock it backwards your own way, and then your scrum half then drops it, that still counts as a line out one. So it's a bit funny. It's a bit like scrum stats. Like you haven't lost the scrum if you get if you concede a penalty on your not your foot in. Like the, the stats are a bit. Funny. Yeah. But yeah, they were just they were pretty poor. Um, France's line out. Um, their mall was good. They've got some good forward circuit. Their number four, whose name totally escapes me, was really good. I think she got the player of the match. Uh, hopefully somebody will remember her name. I'm really sorry. Um, uh, Mane uh, Fileu. Yeah, what was that? Probably pronounced that horribly. Maz will be <laughs> on to me telling me I'm a stupid idiot. <laughs> I was gonna say you, your partner would tell you you're an idiot, won't you? She speaks French. <laughs> well, that's a controversial subject, actually, but that's for a story for another day. Um, okay, so that that's that game, Leslie. I'll stick with you. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tee up a, a mean question that you can bat away. It, it, is the yeah. Six Nations a foregone conclusion over the year because England are so good compared to everybody else? Yes, I think it is. No one is at the level of England yet, unfortunately. We saw them beat Italy with 13 players on the park quite easily. There wasn't really much um, good competition, if you like, from Italy. It just, yeah, I can't see anything other than an England slam, unfortunately. But that's just where we are in women's rugby at the moment. Yeah. Everyone else is playing catch up. I mean, you could just take the view that we're the we're witnessing history view, and we just have to kind of respect it and enjoy it. Yeah, it, it it's going to be like this for probably a couple of years, or at least. You know, it's going to be three, four years till everybody else has the same level of investment that England have put into their their yeah. um, women's team and league. No one, no yeah. one's there yet. Yeah. Harley, um, what what do Wales fans have to look forward to next week going going to England? I think um, I think for a lot of us at the moment, we, we're all basically where Italy was about five, six, well, you know, ten, twelve years ago in the men's in the men's six nations. It, it's wins are probably not going to happen unless you're France. France probably have other points who close to have a chance. For the rest of us, I think, is about closing this gap. You know, so last year we, you know, we were very competitive for 35, 40 minutes, and then basically the legs were taken out of us. So now a good, imp- a good, you know, a good game for us might be making it to 60 minutes. We're probably still going to concede a bonus point win, but we've got to get closer and closer. And I do think as well for Wales, though, I do think they need to start stepping up and showing improvement. You know, you know, they they've got these solid foundations, but as teams like Georgia found out, having a solid foundation. In, in your forward and your set piece isn't enough to beat the best teams. You need to have that full rounded game. So that's where we've got to see. We've got to start seeing more cohesion. It's something I'm very fed up of saying because I've basically been saying it for the Cardiff podcast from Vrap about Cardiff and, and Wales men. It's very performance based. You know, we've got to see, you know, we've got to see a team playing as well as they can and seeing improvements, almost playing better, you know, in spite of the conditions they are. You know, it's funny when Leslie mentioned everyone catching up to the level of professionalism of England, and you have some people like Jess Hayden who still refer to England women as being professional with a small p, because they have things like they, because of the way they they've moved around the country, they don't nest, they can't guarantee that the hotel will have the catering that they need, or you know they'll have the correct gym facilities or whatever, and it's, and it's worrying you thinking, oh, well, that's how much further the red roses are. How far behind are we actually with all our teams? Okay, well, feels like we ended on a bit of a downer there, but we are. Do you want me to? I I can I can give us a positive if you want. Yeah, go on. The Red Roses provide the only England team that I think anyone who is of Celtic heritage can tolerate. If that is very true, they are the only likable England team on the planet. To the point where it's you always dislike them for being likable. Like, could could you be a bit 
unpleasant like all the rest of the England teams, please. So at least I can have the pleasure of disliking you, but unfortunately you can't. Um, there was some other women's rugby that happened at the weekend that I shall now talk to. There was Super W Women, Super Super Rugby W. Um, Waratahs hammered the Drua 62 21, uh, whilst the Force beat the Reds. Um, now, I thought I was looking at the table wrong and there was no New Zealand teams in it, but there, it turns out there's a whole different league for the New Zealand teams. And I don't know whether it's affiliated to the other one or not, like it's conferences. I, I, so, if someone could write in and tell us. Um, I, I think I can speak in because I think uh, David Lawrence, uh, our friend of the pod, and of you and me, um, I think because obviously New Zealand has Super Rugby Alpiki. I think that's like Alpiki. four. Mate. I might have gone up to five teams now. Um, yeah, yeah that, that, as far as I'm aware, that's a separate entity. I don't it's know if there's plans teams. to merge it. Uh, OK. Oh, cool. It's right, a very good. short competition. I think they play each other twice, have a final. It's... It, it's almost a bit that. like I was um, looking at the fixtures. I don't think they even play each other twice, unless the fixtures yeah, aren't complete. It's it's a bit. It was a bit weird, you know. Remember, like when Super Rugby unlocked, and you had all the New yeah. Zealand, all the Australian teams play against each other, and that was it. Yeah. It, it, okay, it's well, one of those weird fudges. I hope it does. I hope it does merge. But um, so in Super Rugby Alpiki, uh, it's four rounds in. So apologise to everybody that I didn't realise that this was happening. So I now know that it's happening. Chiefs are currently top. Um, with zero losses, they're ahead of the Blues in seconds. Um, so looking forward to keeping track of this one. And there was also another international game. There was a friendly between Spain and the, um, South Africa. What's the South African ladies team called? It's not the Springboks. It's the something else. I don't have a name, I don't think. I think it's just says, say, women at the moment. Hmm. Unless someone's come okay. up with something really corny like Lady Box, which just sounds really <laughs> awful. <laughs> So I know the sevens are the blitz box, and then you've got the yeah. baby box for the under twenty yeah. side. The, the, there's somebody I follow on Twitter um, who's South African who was tweeting this week about getting a name for the ladies' rugby team because it was just uh-huh. women's box or, or, or women's team. The gazelles or something like that. Although I feel that might be another African nation's name. Yeah, there must be a, a the row box. Because a rose a female deer, a deer a female deer. No, do, a doe's a deer, a female deer. Oh, do you not remember deer. the song? Oh, sorry, I thought I was quoting it right. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, moving on. So yeah, um, South Africa beat Spain. Is the upshot of that right? URC. Um, okay, we'll start with Cardiff versus Glasgow or Glasgow versus Cardiff on Friday night. So the question I want answering is this: If you look at the URC table, you would say there was a top three: Leinster, Bulls, Glasgow. That's what the points tell you. But there is a prevailing opinion uh, amongst fans, amongst fun, so maybe some pundits, that Glasgow are a bit wobbly, that it feels like the wheels are going to come off any moment. Leslie, is that accurate, true? Are, are Glasgow true top three URC team? Oh, uh, have they shown signs of being wobbly particularly this season? I don't think I so. Mean, they, Barely beat Cardiff, so they can't be that crazy. <laughs> fair, that's a fair point. <laughs> um, I think if you look who played, given that not all of Scotland's internationals were back, I I don't think that was a necessarily a bad result. Um, but given they are a Scottish team, the 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 opportunity to really Scotland it up is is always there. To, <laughs> to, yeah, to, to to have a crisis. Um, I I don't think so. I I hope not. Um, I think we they've got like Sabre to play twice and some. some I mean, obviously they're going to lose to the Scarlets this weekend, can't they? But no, not happening. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Hugh. Oh, you uh, said that about Benetton a few weeks ago. Come on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know what voodoo shit you pulled. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I don't know if Franco will allow them <laughs> to, uh, to have a, a meltdown. He doesn't seem the type <laughs> to, to suffer fools gladly, and uh, he's got this team going pretty well, I think. They said that in the half in the half time they were interviewing one of the Glasgow players, and they were like, "What's um." What's Franco like? Is he calm? And the Glasgow player went, um, he can be calm. Um, 
and the interviewer went, what, is he angry a lot? And he went, oh yeah, he right, gets angry a lot. <laughs> okay. Um, Harley, obviously being the Cardiff fan, you, you're going to talk about it um, in depth on Cardiff Central and you've already spoken about it on RAP. Um, one player that I want to ask you about was scored a, a lovely try um, is Ben Thomas. Hmm. I was, the more I think about it, the more I feel like this guy needs to be in the Wales team. I think he's the perfect 23 jersey wearer um, for Wales because he can cover 10, um, 12 and fullback. Where, it, how, how is he coming along? How is he progressing? So he, he sort of broke onto the seat, you know, and it was a very, it's a very, it was a very hard midfield to break into at Cardiff, because you know, if for, for ages we've had Hallahood and Lilo, the bad boys, the dream, you know, the absolute dream team, you know, at, you know, every Cardiff fan's favourites, and you know, and then Max Llewellyn sort of breaking through as a twelve, and with Ben Thomas also being a twelve, it, it sort of went and they wanted that little bit more bosh and centre. Though Max does have a fantastic set of hands, you know, and this, but this season he's really started to make that twelve jersey his own. I mean, one of the biggest complaints about him was he didn't seem to be physical enough for the for the twelve jersey, which I think is the area of his game that he's brought up brought on most this season. Um, you know, his game awareness is quite good. Having played bit games at ten and at fullback as well, that helps. His kicking game's been very good. He's a wonderful passer. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd argue he maybe not necessarily the twenty three. I think he, he's got a shout for the um for the twelve jersey itself. Hmm. I think actually he, that would be interesting. Gatlin seems think, to want the passing 12, doesn't he? I mean, when you look at, like, you know, how his persistence with Nick Tompkins, you know, how much he really wanted Joe Hawkins uh, to, you know, to be his 12 last year, it's, you know, he, he clearly wants that distributing playmaker 12, but I feel like what we need, but at the same time, no major international team has a, a simple, you know, just as basically a 10 at 12. You know, they do have someone who can carry the ball, but, you know, you've got, You've got Sione Tupelotu. I mean, Scotland looked a lot worse at the tail end of the Six Nations when Tupelotu was injured. As brilliant a player, brilliant players as Staff and McDonald and Cam Redpath are, you know, Cam Redpath doesn't really have the carrying game, so he can't really take the pressure off Finn. And Staff and McDowell, I have seen him kick and pass. I know he has played bits of 10, but I would say it's not on the same level as Tupelotu. And you know, then it's you know, it's sort of almost like, well, he's probably he's most likely going to carry. So it make it you know, the idea of having this triple threat twelve is it makes you sit as a, sit up as a defender because you don't know what's coming your way. It's so yeah, I'm you know, Ben Thomas looks like he could be our answer to that question. So yeah, I, I, I don't know what he's in. I don't know if it's just because Gatlin wants him to be a ten, and the way Jockey's been giving Tina to beer all the yeah. minutes, it's that's not <laughs> yeah. happening. But he just to be has been a hell of a signing for you. Where would you be without him? Mm. My goodness, I can't believe I, the WRU tried to block that. I, I stand by. He's prob- I reckon he's the signing of Welsh rugby for this season. Yeah, I think I he's in the way he's made Cardiff a lot less flaky. Even though some of his goal kicking has been, our kicking game has been outstanding this season, and it's kept us in games. You know, we're on eight eight losing bonus points in the league. It's you know that's kept that's kept this in. You know it's only really that late, suggests and that, even then that they suggests didn't do a job. that you, something's going to click at some point, doesn't it? Yeah, it suggests that something's coming. Sometimes we can get over that hoodoo against the Scarlets and be great. <laughs> we robbed you in those games. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, moving on then. So Leslie going to Edinburgh got our Tonkin out in Cape Town against the Stormers. No shame in that. Um, we put out a video at the weekend saying, "Are the Stormers really title contenders?" And um, yeah, sorry, Stormers. <laughs> Edinburgh, where where are they where are they going? Are they going to be? It just feels like they're very middle as a team. Yeah, they're very mid, aren't they? Uh, I I don't know what is going on there. I I'm, I watched them. I did actually see this game because it was on at the same time as um, Scotland women's game, so I, I chose that um, rightly. I think um, I watched back some of the highlights and I, I just don't know what Edinburgh are trying to do you're you're watching their, their them playing you're like I don't know what the game plan is here I can't I can't even say oh yeah this is what they're trying to do and they're just not executing it well it's like I don't I don't know what they're doing I don't know if they know what they're doing but it's just not working whatever it is um they look sluggish they look slow um you know at the butter knife 
just I, I don't know if it's the players that are the problem, if it's the coaching team, it's a mix of both. But yeah, it's not it's not great there at the moment. If they're mid table, I think they'll be very lucky this season because I just don't. Mm-hmm. I'm not seeing enough green shoots to be at least quietly confident that they could pick off a few folk. I just, it looks it just looks really poor to me at the moment. Unfortunately, they're very they're very. We beat the teams that are worse than us and lose to the teams that are better than us. Type yep. team. They're very just like we're here. And they they shouldn't be. They you know they have pretty decent backs front row. The backs are ridiculous, but we're struggling to get the backs involved at all. Like you, I don't know Duhan didn't play this week, but he's played previous weeks and he appears to not be in there because he's just not getting involved in the game. Like you have one of, at least in, in the one of the best wingers in the URC, at least, and you can't do anything with him. It's mad. Mm. Yeah, mm. not not good vibes at Edinburgh at all. Just saying. Do you think it's had something to do with like the the coaching issues they've had over the last couple of seasons? Because obviously. Mike Blair came in, uh, you know, he had a fantastic you know, debut season. And then as his attack got a bit found out, he, you know, he realised that actually what he wants to be is an attack coach, which actually I have huge respect for. Mm-hmm. I have huge respect for someone to say, no, that's not what I want to do. I want to, I want to be this. I feel like, you know, like I think Stephen Scott and I feel Steve Tandy is another one who um, head yeah. coaching wasn't for him and is making his name as a world-renowned defence coach. I know Sean Everett's come in, who, you know, before before getting the Edge of McGrig was famous for being nilled by Car- by Cardiff. Yes, that Cardiff. And yes, I'm going to mention that 35-0 game against the Sharks <laughs> because I'm a Cardiff fan on a podcast and I have to mention it at least once. <laughs> it's, it's part of what I'm, I'm not allowed to wear a Cardiff stash if I don't mention it. It's a legal requirement now. But yeah, it's um... it, it does seem like, and I feel like they're struggling for identity. I, at least with Mike, you knew what he was trying to do. The execution wasn't always there, but he was obviously very attack minded. And when they got going, they were great. But I don't, I haven't seen enough from Sean Everett yet to go, yeah, this guy is really great because he just he isn't producing anything, really. Yeah, it's just poor. It's just, a lot of mm. meh at the moment. Elsewhere in the URC, Munster have snuck back into fifth place. <laughs> are, are they going to do it again? Fourth. They're back in fourth. Audio listeners, Howley just held his fingers up. Um, um, that kind of came out of nowhere. A, a scrappy win over the Ospreys that they kind of like scored, scored a couple of tries by accident, particularly the one that bounced along the touchline, um, but didn't go out. That was quite funny. Um, but yeah, Harley, do you think Munster are title contenders? Are they going to do it? How good does RG Snowman look, by the way? Absolutely. This is joke. this is peak. This so everyone's you know a lot of people are joking about like Leinster. You know they're paying like half a million half a million euros for a player who's going to be who's only going to play like four or five games. I mean, yeah, but the four or five games he's going to play are going to be your quarterfinals, semi-finals, finals. The games you want RG Snowman at his peak. I mean, Munster are a team that you know I, th- I think Squidge. Uh, said, you know, Munster are a team that are, have this season based purely on narrative. There's no tactics. It, it, the tactics are all smokescreen. It's all about the narrative. But I mean, it does show just how congested that 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 set that sort of I'd say probably about third, fourth to to like eleventh is in the URC, which I think is fantastic for the league. It's annoying some of us, you know, particularly all the Welsh sides are all straggling, with the exception of the Ospreys. Yeah, you, yeah, who weirdly lose is, games is when they try and 12, right? <laughs> when they try and play expansive rugby, and they need to stop with that bollocks and kick the fucking ball. Uh, yeah. It's what gets them wins. Yeah, the URC posted some highlights and were just like beautiful attacking rugby hashtag monster, and I was like, Are you sure? <laughs> but I think Munster hey, actually do so have a really good attacking game. I think great to play boring rugby thing. Yeah, but yeah, I think it's. I, yeah, I think Munster could do it, but I mean, it's one of those things. They did have a, they, I mean, they have their annual early half of the season. Oh, everyone's injured now. Everyone's fit, and you know, and it's like, yeah, ah, surprise. Yeah. We were just saving all the good players for when it counted. That that is the thing about a playoff 
league is that the first half of the season doesn't really matter. It's not, you only need to win your last seven games and you're probably going to win the title. Um, I also just mentioned, obviously, talked about it earlier, Scarlet's won. It's a bit like when Wales beat Fiji. And I'm like, yay, but also, I don't know. Like, because <laughs> I, I, I want Benetton to do well. So I'm happy, but I feel bad. Like, I wouldn't, if we'd have lost, I'd have been like, at least Benetton won. But, I mean, they beat what they beat Cardiff, so that you know, at least you've got that that excitement, enjoyment. So got that. I hope I hope they don't. If they finish like eleventh now, it's going to be so disappointing after the start of the season they had. Um, other results: Lions beat ten man Connor. Uh, maybe that's why Ender's really not here tonight. It's not ten man, fourteen men. Wrong sport. Um, so the, sorry, the Lions were down to fourteen men and they beat Connor in Connor, and it was in Slabacania who got sent off as well after ten minutes. So, times. Um, it, it, sorry, just just want to pick on that because I was listening to Master of None pod um, uh, on my way to work, on my way to and from work, and um, they 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 made bring, made a point actually, something I find quite pertinent to a lot of to quite a few teams of how people seem to get playing against fourteen men so wrong. Yeah, because like, Connick did it when when Cardiff went down a man and you know really struggled to beat us. And it sounds like you know, they had a similar time against the Lions who had an attack that kicked clipped a lot better but this always seems to be the conception of oh there's 14 people let's throw the ball around because it's going to be space away. Wales and nightmares against it all the times we've been up a man against um, England especially when actually the space usually is hidden somewhere yeah. in the middle because they're because they're like oh they're going to throw the ball wide so we'll make the gap um was it me you who you have um, long speculated actually the easiest player to lose in this sort of situation is a flanker because it's yeah. the player you can hide the most because the way they defend is Usually a lot more of a room and roll. It's quite a yeah. It's just come on, Connor. I really want you to do well. You're my Irish team. If I had to pick anyone in green, it might as well be the green one. Yeah. And then finally, the last. Oh, I should say, Leinster beat Zebra. Uh, good crowd in Zebra, three and a half thousand, which isn't very much in compared to other teams. But Zebra regularly get less than two thousand, so three and a half thousand is essentially. It's on a par with Ospreys. Oh come on, Harley. We weren't going to. We weren't going to go there. Um. <laughs> And Going then for last the game, from James. Yeah, the <laughs> last game that we all watched was uh, Bulls against Dragons. I, I think Bulls were playing in their slippers this game. I thought they were like, we've got a big game against Leinster and we've got a stop off in Newport on the way there. And then the Dragons made a good fight of it. I thought the Dragons scrum held up quite well. I thought their mall defence was excellent. But Leslie, you were tweeting during the game like, hang on a minute. <laughs> the Dragons are drawing with the Bulls. That can't be right. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't see the beginning, so I, I, I tuned in later on, and I was like, "Hang on, I was expecting dragons to be ground into a fine paste, but it wasn't happening." <laughs> yeah, I didn't think Bills just kind of fell asleep, didn't they? They were just, I don't know, couldn't be bothered by the looks of it. Just yeah, yeah. plodded their way through the game. Yeah, and how Billy LaRue had a couple of fuck it, I'll do it myself moments and that got them over the he, line. He did go a bit full for them, yes. Um, yeah. I do think Dragons were very unlucky. I do think, they, as much as I don't want to go into ref chat in detail, but it did, it did seem to pervade the bias. I mean, it's probably confirmation bias on my part. I want to think that teams get ref differently based on their reputation because yeah. things that weren't looked at that you reckon, not, you know, if it'd been reversed, might have been looked at and... You know, like Kai Evans fifty twenty two versus that wasn't versus Willie Rose's first one that was, and I mean, at least on TV. I mean, obviously linesmen and TMOs will have the cameras, and maybe it's just because we don't hear that communication, and that's where I think it, it it becomes a bit more frustrating. So I do think the comms between the rest, the TMO, and the audience, whether it's in the stadium or um or on TV, need to be a bit better. Um, but you know, they looked like they were identical kicks, and one was said, Oh, well, of course, that's 50 22 because it's Willie LaRue, or ah, oh, well, it's only Kai Evans, and it probably wasn't. Yeah, it, you know, it just seems the one of those that always sticks with me and will stick with me forever was in the Pro 14 final over in Dublin. Um, uh, James Davis got done for a um, a very, very soft late hit for audio listeners. I'm doing quotation marks. On Johnny Sexton. Johnny Sexton, obviously being a Leinster player, goes down like he's been shot. Um, later, late submission for the Oscars, um, and the referee blows it up. Yeah, yeah, penalty to Leinster, and um, Johnny Sexton kicks the ball down as the 22 in Leinster, maul it over, and this was right on half time, and we never recovered from that. And it's just that feeling of like that would never have been given the other way around. 
that would never have been Scarlett's given that um, decision against Leinster. And you know what? When you talk about like that, that status is earned by being good. You get favourable decisions. So it's kind. Of, it's it is still a meritocracy that's just in there. Anyway, moving on to some uh, other rugby around the world. Then in our rugby roundup, so. Super Rugby for Gian Drewer got a dramatic win at home of the Waratahs. Uh, golden points, drop goal, uh, exciting times. I still don't like Golden Point, but I hold a double standard. And if the Fiji Union Drewer did it, I like it. Them as the rules. Um, Crusaders still winless, five from zero, a really bad, poor game from the Blues. Blues should have put about 50 on them. Uh, and Force beat the Reds, uh, 40 points to 31, in all of the reasons why I don't like Australian rugby. Uh, Japan Rugby League One is on Rugby TV. It's on, sorry, Rugby Pass TV now. So if you want to get up early in the morning, you can watch two rug, uh, um, Jap Japanese league games a week. Um, they put the Wild Knights on first, which is a good call. Wild Knights are a really, really good team. I think they would easily hold their own in most leagues around the world. Um, and they hammered Kubota Spears 55 22 away from home. And then finally, um, in Super Rugby Americas, Raptors overcame. Oh, I haven't updated the notes. The Raptors actually beat someone else, not not Ikari, someone else. But um, bad news for the Raptors: they are employing one Rufus McCain uh, to play in their team, McLean, at the moment. And so speaking to David Obscon of the Earth, shout out David. He is worried that Rufus uh, McLean is going to be turning out for the USA before too long, um, which isn't isn't a great look for them. Uh, if you don't know what his backstory is. Google it. Right, um, moving into the top 14, and it was mentioned earlier, the incredible UBB versus Toulouse game. So this is why we talk about rugby around the world. So people know that these games are huge, and it was it's so delivered. It was such an amazing attacking game. It was drama right to the end. Damien Penno was on fire. Right early on, Thomas Ramos, who was playing um, 10 for Toulouse, got injured, and you're like, oh, no. And then who comes off the bench to replace him? Antoine bloody Dupont. And he Duponted hard during this game. He nearly got stepped by a hooker at one point, but he recovered it marvellously. And then he put in this incredible try assist where he burned off half the team and then did an, a no-look reverse pass and put some of it. But UBB got over the uh, winning line in the end in intense fashion. Leslie, did you manage to catch the highlights of this one? I did. Uh... I, I, what I did notice was there was like 90,000 views already on it when I watched it earlier on today. Uh, it's only like 12 minutes or something, but it just looked like it was chaos from from what I saw. Um, the, the defensive lines were just an optional extra. <laughs> just, just, just just classic French rugby, just vibes, you know, it was great. Yeah. Well, it um, was... Um... A very typical Damien Penno bullshit moment where he went for an intercept and <laughs> um, the guy realised he was going to intercept it, so deliberately hit it forward. And then there was a debate of, of like, well, is that a penalty try? Because if he had have intercepted it, he probably would have scored. And there was all the people like, the the team in possession have deliberately knocked it on and we have to award a penalty try. And there was a lot of mental gymnastics and eventually I think they just went, Let's just award a penalty and just move on with our lives. It's I think it was a penalty cool. yellow card because I, I, I managed to catch it. Well, I caught some highlights. I caught the first half highlights because I found a, a five-minute highlight package and thinking, hang on, there's been a lot of restarts and stuff. Hang on, we're three minutes in and we're only on ten minutes. Oh, dear. <laughs> but I caught I caught that. And yeah, it was a very that was a very weird situation. I, I, caught, yeah. I, I might have to have a look to see if Fireplay you've kept a recording of the full game, although I've really it. They might. It's definitely. They, they're very quick to get rid of it after. after they that. are sometimes, but it, it was a very, very good watch. Um, and like I said, UBB got over the line at the end. La Rochelle lost again. They got beat by Bayon. Um, Scarlet's legend Uzer Kasim scoring for Bayon again. Um, how are they making love house there? Uh, Stade Francais is still top. Weirdly, uh, English Prem. You guys both watched the Bath game, right? I saw bits of it in between. Not most of it. Yeah, but I, yeah. What did you What did you make of it? Uh, they beat Saints, didn't they? Did Saints they beat Sale. Did not Sale? Sale. No, Sale. Sale. No, Sale. Yeah, it was a very. It was as Bath versus Sale as you'd expect it to be. 
but in the wrong way round. Bath were very physical and say oh, tried to do lots of tarty stuff. It was it was quite a weird game. But I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I really like the uh the, the bath ten, twelve, thirteen. Mm. It's a particularly nice combo. Uh I thought Oi, Oi Lawrence had a very good game. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, not one of my favourite players when we move on. Um, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. You 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 were trying to get ahead of me there, I think, uh, Hugh. Yeah, I was. Um, um, and yes. So I just sort of sorry, said, anything, sorry, go on. I was about to say Finn Russell showing that anything a born English ten can do, he can do better with the shonkiest drop goal I've ever seen. It was wonderful. <laughs> so I, I kind of tweeted, you know how we only see clips from the J- the Japanese league when a South African second row does something crazy in it. Or Cesar Colby does something in it. That's what the English Prem is now. It's just whenever Finn Russell does something, that's the only clips and highlights that we ever see. Or Jasper Visa for um, Leicester. I do have a TAF watch, if if you oh, yeah. permit me. Um, so obviously, I although I'm a Bristol fan, I, the one the one Friday of the two Friday night games I saw was uh, Gloucester's win over Leicester, and Max Lewen got a rare actual proper game of rugby for Gloucester, and that's he was thing. very very good. Um, Sarri's thumped Quinns at the Tottenham Stadium, but the real question is, who the heck are these 61,000 Sarri's fans who came out on that? That's very suspicious. Paid actors. It's a bit like Australia. It doesn't really exist. That's a flat earth joke, uh, <laughs> which I don't believe in. Um, I, I assume that was 40,000 hospitality corporate boxes. That's all I can imagine what it, it was. Um, Harley, are you pleased with how Bristol are going this season? Um, I wouldn't say pleased. I'm very pleased with the result against North uh, against Saints. You know, you know, beating top of the table. You know, quite unanimously, seven tries with seven different scores, which is always a sign that your attacks are at least doing uh, different things. Because usually, you know, if you've got one person who's like way above on try score, it you you're saying that you're doing one thing. Uh, not always, obviously, but yeah, uh, I do think ever since Pat Lamb had that seven year contract, we Bristol have been very. Very hit and miss. It's been very hard to like get any sort of consistency. It it does. So there are times when you feel like Lamb's parked the bus a bit, and now he's getting towards the end of his contract. He started coaching again, try and get his portfolio up. Yeah, he's like, oh, I'll think... start trying again in five years' time. <laughs> yeah, I think. Will Matt come in? That'll that'll, that'll help. Yeah, he's the one a thing... great try as well against Stormers. Yeah, the one thing because the one thing Bristol need. Is a more big, expensive marquee players, but <laughs> then you know less solid people. I think having yes. AJ McGinty back and solidly back, and you know he's not. He seems to have got over his bunch of niggles. Is really helping Bristol. Uh, I said part of my trepidation is about Callum Sheedy coming back to Cardiff. When I'm like, he hasn't exactly been playing for Bristol, has he? So it's not like he's in any form at all. I can't understand the people who are saying like he should be in. He should be starting for Wales. I'm like, have you what? <laughs> like. <laughs> Have you just been reading Wales Online articles and that's how you basically form your entire rugby opinion? I mean, the amount of people I see who I've seen who's telling me that Teddy Williams should be a six after having a fantastic performance in the second row is um, yeah, quite baffling. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, English Championship, Ealing won again, obviously. Uh, Jonah Holmes scored for them. Uh, Coventry won as well, which is fun. One of our favourite teams. Uh, Emma La Harley, you're a Jackals fan? Uh, yes, uh, I, I wish you'd pick me of any of the three. Pre- uh, was it uh, last week when we won, or two weeks before when we won? Um, so yeah, I fit. Unfortunately, so I said. Unfortunately, Jackals went down twenty-two thirty-five to Nola Gold in a weird game where we are we were actually two points better than last time last season, which is a mad game where we somehow scored as the same number of tries as Nola, but missed every single kick. Uh, otherwise, uh, free Jacks. Let's check my notes here. Free Jacks beat Chicago Hounds in Chicago, 2017. Uh, the newly created team Anthem beat Utah Warriors, 36-32. Uh, Seattle beat... Hmm? Yeah, that so that was win? Anthem's first wins. Speaking of first wins, I think it was Anthem, or it might be the Atlanta ones. This is where I realised I've, I've got the logos and forgotten what all the logos are. <laughs> but speaking of first wins, so uh, play, you know, a team which has a player from both of our URC teams, Hugh, uh, Miami Sharks, they got their first Miami win. Sharks. Yeah, Miami Sharks, they beat uh, this one might be Anthem and the other one might be Atlanta. 
I really should have double checked this. <laughs> but yeah, so Miami Sharks definitely won 50 21 to a team. Uh, Old Glory went down 11 27 to San Diego Legion. And Houston Sabercats carry on their unbeaten run. So they top the Western Conference with uh, the New England Free Jacks top in the East Conference. Sabercats against Seawolves at 42 40. Man, yeah, that was a very, very high scoring game. I that, That's yeah. one I, thankfully, the rugby network do keep most of their uh, replays on. Apart from weirdly, I can't get the first game of the season for the Dallas Jackals. It's really weird. I've had some very weird problems with the rugby network uh, this I've season so far. But... Uh, yeah. And then in the Welsh Prem, Newport have drawn level with Clan Dovery uh, after beating Ever Vale. A uh, big game this Thursday between uh, Clan Dovery and Newport mm. Thursday night on telly. Definitely watch it. It's going to be. Good. I'm not. I'm not being patronised into the Welsh Prem. I promise. That's going to be a really good game. Definitely yeah. watch it. Uh, Cardiff beats Swansea 38 34. We covered this on the Friday Breakfast Show, Harry. But you've been following Cardiff in the Prem this season. Um, I've been. I've been trying to and trying to watch the games where they could. If it, unfortunately we had to record Cardiff Central on the Thursday night that game because I was going to go to that game. Yeah. And yeah, that sounded like a a game where we seem to be. It, it started off bad. I'm not going to lie. They had us in the first half. Just trying to see how many memes I can get in one, in one game. But yeah, we managed to pull it back and then, you know, went ahead and came through. But yeah, it's it's a big thing for us securing a top four finish, which, given the troubles we've had, probably because one of the knock-on effects with the budget cuts in the U up for the for, cut, for the main side is um, the rags get less academy and sort of like the fringe yeah. squad players. So that's, you know, and that, that's been, that's helped the backbone for what's, Cause Cardiff to be so successful in the last few seasons, you know, and I hope we do get get top four playoff and have a decent run. Uh, you know, with the announcement head coach Steve Law's going to leave at the end of the season, who's been you know fan- fantastic for the Rags this season for many many years now. Cool. And then uh, lastly, to finish up, no TV guide with uh, Ender being absent, but stay tuned to our socials to pick it up at the end of the week. Tune into the Friday Breakfast Show as well to hopefully hear it there. Uh, if you need a 15 minute pod to just pick up your Friday, that's definitely the one for you to listen to. You can catch it on audio only. Uh, and then just lastly, I just want to ask you to for a game that you're most looking forward to this weekend. Leslie, you first. Uh, Scotland women against France, and that's because I'm going. <laughs> Ah, oh, where's it being held? Uh, Hive. Oh, well, that's gonna that's gonna sound huge in there then. Yeah, it'd be good. Looking forward to that. I can't decide whether that's the bigger game or Ireland Italy is a bigger game. I feel like the Scotland one's a bigger game. Ireland Italy could be closer. I think. I think Ireland have a reasonable chance of a sneaky little win over the Italians. Cool. Harley, what's your big game? Um. Weirdly, I'm, I'm going to go because oh, we mentioned two of them. I'm going to go for the third one because it's it's going it's going to be uh, Wales versus England Ashton Gate because it's always huge. Even if it the results are foregone conclusion, the margins still very up for it. And it's um, in the point I was going to add with the Ireland Italy game. I think that's going to be a huge barometer for where Ireland are with this with this sort of like mid pack. Whereas I feel like France is probably right on the edge of reaches. I think this is where Wales is. You know, Wales have talked about using you know the reason they were happy to be in WXC one even though they lost all their games was because it was it gave them a platform to work out how far away they are from the top teams and you can't necessarily work out how far that gap is until you've played them so you know I think that's why I think I always look forward to Wales England because it does give me a good yardstick of where the team are what do we actually need to work on or was it that's the thing as as nice as wins are I'm so used to not winning that yeah I, 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 if you two hadn't picked those, I would have picked uh, one of those as well. I think um, my other game to watch out for is definitely Leinster Bulls on Friday night. Um, huge top of the table clash in the URC. Bulls have brought all their spring box and now there's murmurs that the Leinster, Leinster might actually field their island internationals as well. Um, so I'm just so looking forward to that. That's going to be a, a, a potentially test match intensity club game. I'm really looking forward to it. Anyway, that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you so much to everyone for listening. Remember to check out the Friday Breakfast Show. Like, comment, subscribe if you're on YouTube. Uh, Thank you to my wonderful guests for helping me out this evening. And we'll see you again on Friday morning. Cheers.